Hi, I'm Pastor David Wendell, Assistant to the Bishop for Ministry and Ecumenism in the North American Lutheran Church. This sermon is for the second Sunday in Advent. The Gospel reading is from the Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, who shall prepare thy way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And there went out to him all the country of Judea and all the people of Jerusalem, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and had a leather girdle around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the thong of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. One particular talk show host has each week what he calls the Ultimate Issues Hour in which he discusses ultimate issues. So in that light, I thought we might have an ultimate issues hour this week, or at least an ultimate issues 20 minutes. And the ultimate issue is repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the reason this is our ultimate issue is because it's really at the heart of our gospel lesson for this second Sunday in Advent. And it's at the heart of our gospel lesson because this is the Sunday of John the baptizer and at the heart of his ministry was proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Which means he was calling people to be baptized, to be initiated into a new life of repentance and forgiveness. If you look at the biblical material related to John, what you find is that everywhere, always, he was calling people to repent, to be baptized and be forgiven, because in this and through this, the people of God would prepare the way of the Lord, making his path straight, hastening his coming. And though there is at least one Sunday every Advent when we hear about this mission and ministry of John, my sense is that most of us don't really understand, first, repentance and forgiveness, and why these are so important in our lives. And second, we don't really understand why it is or how it is that our practice of repentance and forgiveness actually prepares the way of the Lord. Don't these things have to do with us lowly humans and our lives and our relationships? How then could they in any way, shape or form make straight the path for the Lord's coming? These questions are why it's worth focusing today on the ultimate issue of repentance and forgiveness. And one might think it surprising that Christians in general, and Lutherans in particular, can be so out of touch with repentance and forgiveness. Because together with having a brief rite of confession and forgiveness, each and every week in our Liturgy of Word and Sacrament, our Lutheran confessions affirm the biblical and theological practice of individual repentance and absolution of sins. Some seem to think that private confession is something only available in the Roman Catholic Church, but in our Lutheran confessional documents, Martin Luther and the lay theologian Philip Melanchthon state over and over again that among our churches, opportunity for private individual repentance for our sins 
and the personal specific assurance of forgiveness is to be a regular parish practice. In the small catechism, Luther writes concerning the office of the keys, confession has two parts. First, that we confess our sins, and second, that we receive absolution, that is forgiveness, from the pastor as from God himself, not doubting but firmly believing that by it our sins are forgiven before God in heaven. In the Augsburg Confession, Melanchthon writes, It is so taught among us concerning confession that we should keep private confession and absolution in the churches and not let it decline. In the large catechism, Luther writes, If you are a Christian, you should be happy to run much more than a hundred miles for confession. Therefore, he says, when I urge you to go to confession, I'm doing nothing other than urging you to be a Christian. Luther is saying, by having opportunity for confession of sins and the forgiveness of them, we're not advocating something that's only Roman Catholic, but something that is Christian. And whether in the general confession of sins on Sunday mornings or in some cases in private confession, we are being wholly Christian and wholly Lutheran by repenting of our sins and seeking forgiveness for them. As Luther said, when our churches offer private confession and forgiveness, we're not following the Pope, but we're being Christians, following Jesus' own instruction for forgiveness of sins that we might be forgiven as we forgive others. And that, of course, is what John the Baptist is advocating as well, that we live lives of repentance and forgiveness, and by doing so, we prepare the way for the Lord's coming. And I know, I know we haven't yet answered the question, why is repentance and forgiveness so important? Why is it an ultimate issue? And how can that prepare the way of the Lord? Here's the truth of the matter, as plainly as we can put it. Repentance and confession of our sins against God and our neighbor and giving and receiving forgiveness ourselves has to do with being at peace in life. As St. Peter talks about it in our second reading for this Sunday, 2 Peter chapter 3, where he writes, The Lord is not slow about coming, but is forbearing, wishing that all should reach repentance. And Peter continues, but as we wait for new heavens and a new earth, be zealous to be found without spot or blemish and at peace. You see, repentance and forgiveness, being cleansed of our sin means being at peace. It breaks down barriers and opens us to Christ in all the ways he comes to us. When there is division within the body of Christ, the ones who have given and taken offense are not at peace with each other, but neither is the body, the community, at peace because of the breach. And as the two who are at odds may keep their distance from each other, not talking, not interacting, yet visibly at odds, they often enlist others, whether actively or passively, to join their sides. Now there is no unity, so... There is not one body in the congregation, but two, two entities who are at odds with each other. Many of us have been in congregations where this kind of enmity exists. Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So is Jesus present readily in a congregation in which such breaks and fractures and party spirit and anger and opposition exist? While we trust that the Spirit would be at work trying to bring about healing, we have to wonder whether Jesus is present in such congregations. As one who works with congregations in conflict, it's obvious in many congregations which are divided that 
Jesus doesn't seem to be present, or maybe he's been sidelined or forced out altogether. In the same way, in a healthy congregation gathered in Christ's name, you can experience the presence of Jesus. It's obvious that he's there at the center of every relationship, the focus of every prayer and act of worship. Without a doubt, Jesus' presence and coming is hindered when there is division and bitterness. His presence and coming is encouraged and welcomed when repentance and forgiveness take place. His way is prepared by the healing and peace that come about when two persons or two factions confess their sin and express forgiveness. True forgiveness and absolution to each other. With repentance and forgiveness, we are opening ourselves to the other in love so that there is healing and wholeness, restoration and renewal within the one body of Christ in the congregation. And as this is true in the church, it's also true in homes and, and among families and friends and neighbors. Unrepentant sin and unwillingness to confess and seek forgiveness Create something of a cancer, a toxicity in congregations, families, and lives that sooner or later brings bitterness, jealousy, and sometimes even hatred. Repentance and forgiveness opens us to healing and peace. And this speeds Jesus on his way, inviting him into our relationships and welcoming him as he comes. And now let's make this ultimate issue more personal and practical and relevant. The place to begin is in our relationship with God. We are to forgive others because we've been forgiven. As St. Paul writes to the church at Colossae, forgive each other, he says, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. We first return to God in heartfelt repentance where we confess our sins and receive absolution, the forgiveness of our sins, whether in the general confession and forgiveness on Sunday morning or in private confession and absolution, we begin to prepare the way of the Lord by getting right with God, so to speak, through repentance and receiving the forgiveness of our sins from God himself. This is the first step. And the second is, we go to our fellow church member. We go to our spouse, to our parents, to our brother or sister, to our friend, neighbor, or co-worker, and in true heartfelt repentance, we admit our sin, and so we seek forgiveness and reconciliation. We swallow our pride, our need to be right, our unwillingness to admit we are wrong, and for the sake of peace and unity and harmony, we confess our sin and we ask for forgiveness. This is all we can do, but we do it. We have no other option as disciples and followers of Jesus but to approach those with whom we are at odds and seek reconciliation. And truly, forgiveness, reconciliation, and healing makes life better. It heals old wounds. It provides balm for the soul sickened by sin. It reduces bitterness and nastiness in homes and families. It can create a new loving spirit in marriages. And yes, it can strengthen and upbuild congregations because it invites Jesus Christ and his peace in. It makes straight the way for the Lord's coming it welcomes him to our church, to our hearts, and into our lives. It prepares the way of the Lord that he may come and come more quickly to us. Repentance and forgiveness is not an option for us Christians. It's an ultimate issue of ultimate importance to us, to the church in the world, 
and to the broken, fractured world. As we pray fervently, come, Lord Jesus, come. This Advent season, let us pray that prayer, but even more, let us make straight the way for the Lord's coming as we live lives of repentance and forgiveness of sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.